All right, and welcome back to another Conquest Corner. On this particular episode, as you'll see in the title, if you read any of that, is we're going to be going through the Canifors and Caratids. Again, for Old Dominion, they're the main army I play, so I'm going through a lot of their stuff first. If you do have suggestions for other things, obviously, if you're watching on YouTube, you can put it in the comments. I'll look through all that or anywhere else I happen to post this thing up. Um, so the goal for this, in case you didn't watch the other one, is we're going to talk about these two units. We're going to talk about them in general, them in the army, why you might choose one or the other in certain circumstances, all of that. I'm picking it this way because they're a double box, so that makes the most sense. When I did the bone combs and Bekefali, I did it that way because they were both single boxes, so there's a comparison. Here's another comparison. So they don't exactly fit the same role, so it's not an apples to apples sort of comparison, but you got to build some models, and I know at least me, I wasn't going to, I was going to magnetize them, you can, but I just didn't have the interest in doing such a thing. So I want to talk about both of those. Now, for this, remember, this is from Conquest, The Last Argument Kings from Parabellum Games. If you are interested in things at the time of this, I think some of the sales are still going on. They're almost over by the time you see this, or if you see this a few days later, they might be. But they do have lots of deals they run. If you are interested in picking up anything from Parabellum Games, um, below this in either the wherever notes I put this, there'll be a code terrain kickers. There's also a link that you can click on so that way you can save yourself 10% and help support the show as well. So if you decide you like these units and you want to pick them up, it's a great way to save a little bit of money and help us out. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to get into the units themselves. So before I get into them, I want to talk about where or how you can take them because that's the most important thing to start with. Now, for these, we are much more limited than we were before, and we will see later when we have much more open sort of options. But for Keratids and Canifors, you're only looking at Fallen Divinity or the Hyra Deacon. Now, I do want to do a full-on dive through the Fallen Divinity. I'm saving that for next, though. Most likely next. There's a, there's a chance I might record something in between, and when you see it, might change. But... I'm saving that one for next because I want to go through everything that the Fallen Divinity can take as a mainstay choice before we talk about her. Because since she takes Kefli, Keratids, Canifors, it makes sense to know everything about them first. Because if you're taking her, you're going to be taking these units. It, it, there's certain ways I feel you kind of should build her. And I think for reasons you should play into what she does and what she brings. And those are things she brings. So she can do that. She's 300 points, of course. Um, she's a monster in every sense of that word. Your other option, of course, like we said, is the Hyra Deacon. The Hyra Deacon, though, does take this as restricted. So that means you'd have to be taking some mainstay. And at most, you're going to get up to two units here. Fallen Divinity is also up to two units. So in reality, you're looking at you know, anywhere from two to maybe six, because you are allowed to duplicate Hyra Deacons if you want it. Remember, you can do two of a character. You can do, I think it's like six of of an actual regiment. I, I forget this. Maybe it's more than six, but I don't spam, so I wouldn't ever look more than like two. But realistically, you're probably looking at taking maybe at most one of each of these units, or maybe two of one of them. I don't see you running a whole, whole lot more, though we will talk about the Fallen Divinity list that did quite well, that did take quite a few. But again, I'm I'm not one who looks at taking tons of the same exact thing. I like to vary up my units, just just me personally. All right, so let's get into them, and then we'll talk about ways that these pieces can or don't support them. All right, so for our canifors and our keratids, as it says, canifors are two ten, keratids are two hundred. So essentially, same price. I know ten different ten points difference. That's nothing in this game. They're both brutes, although Canifors are heavy, so you're looking at turn three or later. Realistically, with the speed of six, turn three isn't a problem because you can just rush them up the board. Remember, turn three, currently in the game, you have to come in from the back edge, even if you're heavy. Starting turn four, you come in from the sides. But when you get 12 inches of move, when you double move, there's nothing wrong with that. That's still a pretty good distance. Uh, where Keratids are medium. So your Keratids, you could have this unit out turn two, um, because you could choose them as your auto, so you could guarantee you have this unit out turn two and start doing you some good. And we are going to talk about how we'll do that. Stat-wise, they're both exceedingly similar. There is some differences, and we'll key in, but a lot of the base pieces are, are, are reasonably the same. Um, both move six. Um, obviously, Canifors have no volley. Um, they're clash three, five attacks on five wounds, three defense with a two evade. 
Keratids, which are the shooting unit. Canophores are the close combat unit. So Keratids, the medium shooting unit. They get a volley stat. Of course, they have to have one. It's volley two. So in line, lower than you would like for volley, but in line with what we tend to do. Clash of two, so their clash is one worse, but they are not your close combat unit, so that's okay. They are four attacks instead of five, but again, they're not your close combat unit, so that makes sense. They also are five wounds. They have the base three defense, although their evade is one worse. It's better for the Canifors to have the better evade because they're the ones getting at the close combat. They could or might need it more than the Keratids do. But both of them sitting at five wounds, both sitting at a base defense of three, which might be the stat they do tend to take depending on what hits into them. Especially maybe a little bit more for the Keratids, because the Keratids are more likely to be the ones getting, say, shot, or getting someone's fast movers, usually lighter unit fast movers into them, so your defense of three is more useful. Uh, both of them are, of course, their animated vessel. They're both terrifying. When we look at the cannon force, when we look at the close combat ones, first thing we're looking at here is Blessed. Um, for anyone who doesn't remember, Blessed, before you roll your dice, either on an attack or on a defense, you can choose to activate Blessed. That means you reroll misses. You can choose either one. You can only do it essentially once per round, and you do have to do it before it happens, but you get those rerolls. That takes this, which is a Clash 3, Let's assume for a second you didn't get the charge or you're not a high enough tier um, to have the auto inspire later once you're already in or whatever it may be. Naturally, they hit 50% of the time. Getting rerolls means they're hitting 75% of the time. If instead you actually were able to get that charge or are tier three or four always inspired, now you're looking into, you know, base numbers to be closer into the 70s and 80s and things like that because now you're hitting four out of six you're hitting about 66 percent, so you're hitting a bit better then when you get that re-roll now you're getting into the 80s so they have cleave one so they can ignore one piece of armor shield whatever it may happen to be they do have impact hits too but they don't have any brutal impact so their impact hits not as useful it's nice, but not as a big determining factor. We'll talk about where I see them fit and why I think that impact is good um, because of where I want to put them. Hardened one. So they are defense three, but they get to ignore one point of you cleaving through them. So much like when we talked about bone golems, how they're a little bit more survivable in that way, these ones are as well. Um, the other things I ever find... Are, are the same thing as the uh, animate vessel terrifying one. Memories of old. So their memory. So remember, starting in tier two, you get it as a draw event. Tier two makes you have flawless strikes. When you are clashing, your hit rolls of one make their defense zero. Um, anything that you generate on top of that doesn't do anything special. Remember in this game currently, now this again could change, but in the current moment, you choose your best save. So if your unit in general, say that cleave one, if their defense would still be better, they're all rolling defense. They're not choosing evade. So they changed a little bit the way this was before where it sits currently, you have to choose your best stat. You're not getting to kind of pick and choose. So on a unit where you get to reroll and um, notice for blessed is reroll failed. So you can't go hunting ones, but still very good. Um, when you're doing this, if you have that flaw of strikes, if they're not going to evade because their evade is better, if they're not going to evade on this, let's assume a three pack for simplicity, you got 15 of them. You're looking at two to three ones. So two to three wounds that just go through again, assuming you don't have an evade. If you do, that always throws off numbers, but two to three that go through you, of course, are terrifying. That's hopefully another maybe one or so off of that not counting all the ones that you actually hit with and because you have those rerolls, it's probably more consistent that you're going to get the two to maybe three ones so that's a little bit of what they do we'll go a little bit more detail into them in a moment canifor so talking about them a little bit um they lack a lot of those block of special rules their special rule is the fact that they get to shoot they have a barrage three 20 inch weapon that is base armor piercing too. This is an army that lacks, now, now is better. We have a couple cleave options, but lacks 
one, long range, and two, lacks armor piercing, those sort of things. We really don't have that much. The um, Archimandrite has a spell that does it out to, I want to say it's 12 inches, 10 or 12 inches. When you look at other things that shoot, so just to kind of make that a fair comparison, um, actually, we'll go through the Memories of Old, then we'll talk about that fair comparison. Memories of Old, two of them, Barrage plus one, so you could be four shots, you could be five shots in half range, because remember, you get an extra shot in half range, and their half range is 10 inches, which is a very far range. And Fluid Formation. In case people don't remember, Fluid Formation means you get a free reform at the start of your turn, or, or start of their activation, or at the end of their activation. Also means, if you're a shooting unit, that you can shoot in any arc. So you can position yourself. The enemy can't save itself by getting behind you. You can still shoot them. So you count as having 360 arc for line of sight. When we think about other shooting units to compare keratids to, we don't have a lot of options. Um, you, of course, have cares. So you could take your light ghosts that shoot barrage three, 12 inches. They have sure shot. Sure. They have insanity. So I have a spell. We do have some shooting type spells, of course. Okay, but hey, on a volley too much like them gets a little bit rough. And I find with cares, I want to be able to shoot and spell, so I'm rarely aiming first. Where with keratids, I'm going to aim first, which means they're going to be hitting 50-50 instead. Um, other things, your cultists, which aren't out yet, but your cultists have, uh, again, on twos, a barrage three, 12 inch with liquid anathema. It helps if you're doing, um, oh, I can't think of the word. Or of death. There we go. It helps if you're doing aura of death. Uh, I only take cultists because they are cheap and they let me get in my recommendates early. I'm oh, sorry, my um, sorry, my higher deacons early. The other option is your centaur caracites. They're a barrage three, 16 inch. They are armor piercing one with deadly shot, which are all very good things. Part of the problem is obviously they're not out yet. Now you can proxy stuff. That's fine. If you're in a tournament, you can't. But there's not out yet, so that's another little bit of a thing to keep in mind. They're probably the most fair comparison, and if they were out, I would make that comparison. And when they do come out, we will talk a little bit more of the back and forth here. Um, overall, the Karakites are a little faster. They have less wounds, though. That's the big trade-off. Um, Rules-wise, otherwise, obviously the Karakites can get more shots, but the Karakites... Um, Caracates, maybe it might be. Caracates. I'm not sure which way to pronounce it. The Caracates. They, I guess the big thing is just their speed. They can get around a little bit more. Although if you can get to that memories of old, I think the Caracates currently outperform them, at least for what I see. You might take them because of who you're taking has that as an option. It kind of forces your hand. All right. So um, I want to talk a little bit about how I see the individual units. And then we'll talk about how to kind of put them in. Uh, I want to go through keratids first because I think they're an easier where to see them. So this is your shooting unit. Naturally volley two. This is um, a unit where, again, I want them turn two. They will often, if, my, if I don't care about getting my warlord in, or... I have a bunch of medium options. Maybe then I'll roll for it. Otherwise, I will make them my auto. I want to see a light unit, if I have one. If a light unit, a little bit up the board, so I can pull these guys in six. And if that's enough, 20 inches. So theoretically, even if you walk on from the end of the board, 26 inches, there's a fairly decent shot that you have shots on someone, unless they're purposely trying to avoid entirely. And if your opponent's staying back rather than attempting to get close to engage, that's a winning strategy. If they are entirely back and I'm very ill positioned, maybe then I'll wait till turn three for them. Maybe I won't make them my auto. Or if everything's ill positioned, I'll have these guys come in near the end of the round of say turn two, let's say for a moment. I will get them in a nice position just with a double march. And I will set them up that now they can just start aim and firing for almost the rest of the game, or at least the next multiple rounds. So what I want to do is try to get them aimed at an objective in the middle, or a little bit off to the side, maybe a little closer to their edge, if I can, their end, if they have one. So that way I can hit their backline people that want to try to avoid getting shot. 
or I can get some good hits on whatever is going to be coming in with that armor piercing too to deal with some of my heavier hitters that are waiting to come in or some of the stuff that's a little bit faster. Um, brutes at six I find are deceptively quick. Um, or at least in this army, deceptively quick. So you can use that to help you get your positioning better. And remember, if you want to cause any issues, you do, once you get to level two, you do have that fluid formation, you do have that reform that you can do. I've been able to use that at times to either deny charges because of where I was with another unit nearby, they couldn't actually make a legal charge. Remember, if... um. So for people who aren't watching, I'll try to make this visual for people who are watching. People are not going to try to explain this as best I can. If you have a unit in front of them and they're angled off in a certain way, you could still have line of sight. But if you do your reform correctly, so if you do your reform, remember, you don't care about your arcs in terms of your shots when you're having that fluid formation. You could turn yourself enough where they now are only able to hit you in the front because of legal facings although they can't actually reach because you're too covered because with that other unit, but you still have a pathway for shots. Whereas maybe with you had it before, they now could connect well. Remember, they have to be able to actually get a decent connection in. This is an old tactic we used to use in Warhammer Fantasy Battle that your shooting units, you could put them in such a way where you can't actually get legal charges because of how wide their units are. So something like that is a potential option with these guys. Um. So Barrage 3, 4, we'll call it, because by the time the game's really getting going, you should hopefully be Tier 2, or we'll talk about some ways to be Tier 2 early. So you're looking at four shots. You can be aiming, shooting, four shots a stand. Let's assume three stands. You're getting about six hits then. Six hits on armor piercing 2. Again, unless it has good evade, and if it has really good evade, why are you shooting it with things with armor piercing? But otherwise, six hits on armor piercing 2, you should be getting you know, four or five, maybe even six going through unless they are defense three with shields and all kinds of crazy stuff. If you're hitting people at, say, defense three or even defense two, now you're getting most of your stuff through. If you can get close enough or they get close enough to you, especially if you have someone in front, if you're able to push them up behind someone who wants to sit on objective, if you can get in that half distance, now you're potentially looking at five shots each. Every little bit extra you can get out is going to do a lot of good. This is a unit, though, that does need to take that aim because you're only naturally hitting on twos. What I do find, though, is with the five wounds and base defense of three, if someone gets into you, you're still rather survivable in terms of your amount of wounds, your defense. Clash, no, I leave. I just leave combat, and since I can shoot from any direction, I can shoot behind me. It doesn't matter the fact that if I leave combat, I've turned around and ran away. That's fine. Shoot behind me. Again, once you're tier two. A lot of our units don't start singing until you get to tier two. So if you're tier one with these, if you're still in that spot, you want to try to keep them away from the enemy. You want to make sure that you're playing down shots. And as soon as you get to tier two, that's when you're going to push them in. Again, you can keep them at range, but that's when if they get someone gets into them, it's not the end of the world because you can just run away and then shoot them. And if you run away, now you're getting an extra shot because you're within 10. For where I see keratids, um, for them in general, I don't take them at every list. The reason I don't take them at every list is because I don't always have the points for them compared to the pieces that I take. Um, just because like lately I've been, like I said, I've been running a lot more carefully. I've been running Fallen Divinity a lot more lately. And when I run her, I don't always take the keratids. Sometimes I take the other options. And if I'm taking Shotikos, Ziliarchs, and all of that, they're not allowed to take it. Neither is Archimandrite. So you have to want to be taking Hierodeacon or Fallen Divinity. For right now, if I'm playing competitive, the problem is what I want to have the Hierodeacon with, which is Cultus, aren't out yet, so I don't always take her. Again, I call that a her. I don't know if it is. I don't always take her, but when I do, I throw a unit of Keratids in there. Um, for these Keratids... I really do like that you get a long range shot. I like the fact that it's enough dice, especially with the aim, that it keeps opponents honest. They don't, they won't be able to keep a small three man in the back because over a couple turns, this can be enough to take them down. Again, remember, since you're naturally going to be four shots at that point, you're hitting about half the time. You're going to get, say, six if they don't have great defense. And if they're keeping in the backfield, they probably don't. That'll be enough over 
two, maybe three rounds to take them down. And that's good enough, or at least to break them. And if you break them, now they have to, now they won't be necessarily scoring that turn, depending on timing and all of that. So I find that they are, I don't want to say distraction because they are very useful, but they're enough of a point sink that people want to go for to do something about that a three man block of for 200 points is a really good spend. I don't tend to take them at more. One, I don't own them at more, but even two, even if I did, I kind of like the three three block because I think it does enough for you without sinking tons and tons of points. There's 65 points per every extra, which is only going to average you about two more hits. And I don't think 65 points for about two more hits is really going to get you that far, realistically, compared to what you could spend 65 or, you know, five more, 70 points on when you take a look at the can of force. So I like a three person block. I like them to, if the opponent is the type of army who wants to push forward, getting them out very early. If the opponent is a little bit slower, I might wait one more turn to get them out, to get them positioned well. That's what I like them for. Of our shooting options, one, we don't have many, and two, they're absolutely the best, at least to me right now. Um, other army things don't really buff them that much. Other than healing them, say from Archimandrite, um, obviously, okay, yeah, I know there's a banner that gives people inspired, not that it matters so much. I know, like, say in Fallen Divinity, you can make give people dread in an aura. Yeah, that helps them because your opponents that aren't inspired, they don't hit them as hard. Sure, there's some of those niche cases, but there's not a particular thing to put on them. What I would say is for that Archimandrite, if you do have an Archimandrite, one, I think it is almost, almost always a requirement to be taking, I always forget the name of it, Unholy Mastery, be able to cast those two spells, because what I want to put on them is Blasphemous Power, if I'm going to put it somewhere. Early, this is a great Blasphemous Power target very early in the game, because it's the only thing that's going to be doing any work early in the game, because everything else is too far away, which means I can get you to at least tier two using this, with the first turn you want to shoot. So I'll get you to do tier two. I'll get the four shots each. I'll get the fluid formation. That'll get you going. Later, then I'll put it on my Cataphracty or whoever else. So I do like, if you have an Archimandra, I think that's a great spell to be able to put on these Canaphores very early because turn two, maybe turn three, no one else really cares yet. Turn three, they might, but usually no one else really cares for that moment. Again, Archimandra can't take it. So you're having to take a higher deacon. Higher deacon doesn't help though. Your other option, of course, is Fallen Divinity. Fallen Divinity doesn't help that much either. Fallen Divinity helps. Again, you could have that 8-inch bubble with Dread, so that way I'm a little more survivable. And Fallen Divinity, maybe the way it helps is it's such a monster target that people are not going to worry about your Canifors because if they let that lady get up to Tier 3, they're going to have a really bad day. All right, let's take a look at the canophores then now that oh sorry the sorry i had the canophores up it was the keratids that we stopped looking at so we we're talking about keratids now we're going to start talking about the canophores all right for canophores um it helps that they are a little bit more of an elite unit that has that clash of three base 70 points extra for each um like i said 200 210 it's a little bit more but with the base clash of three means if you are either tier three always inspired or you have the banner that gives you the eight inch bubble of inspired off of tier two, or you just happen to, you know, have charged in, therefore inspired. Now you're hitting two thirds of the time. You have blessed. I find in general, if I can charge, a blesses on the attack. Otherwise, I save it always for my defense. Um, even not one charged, it depends on what I'm facing. So we talked about, you know, Keratids want to aim for things that are sticking on the backfield because of your range or decently armored things without great evade that are trying to get to you. For canophores, you know, but carefully hit harder. You know, bone golems have some potential, probably hit around the same. They, they meet a little bit of different criteria, but they hit probably around the same. The big thing for these is they are, they have some options against high defense targets with that flawless strikes. They only have the cleave one. Otherwise, I again, I don't rely on relentless blows on bone golems because rolling for ones is a fail strategy. You could get it or you could not. 
I don't rely upon flawless strikes for these. They're nice when I have them, especially if the unit has some decent defense. This way they don't get their defenses. Um, the impact two is fine. You're going to hit half of them because you're on a clash of three. It's something. It's not amazing, but if someone's a little bit lower defense, pretty good. Um, I do like putting these into things that are sitting on that, say, two up save. So maybe it's defense three or defense two with a shield, but your armor pierce, sorry, your cleave one, so you're putting it down to twos. Potentially, if they're a little bit better, even if they're three with a shield, because you will get a few flaw strikes in, and your cleave will at least put them to threes, only save half of the others. That's something. Your impacts become much less then, but impacts without brutal impact, not too great. It's okay. But we have other options that can do that for us. The hardened one is what really helps them because they are much more survivable then. So you can target towards things that help cleave. If they have, say, even just like a cleave of one, they have a little bit, you'll still be on your three-up saves. And if they happen to have a lot more cleave or they happen to be able to cut through people a little easier, that's when you have your bless come into play. Remember, you have to decide before you roll, but you know the turns when you need it for survivability and you don't. I would prefer to use it on offense personally, but... I've seen cases, especially when someone comes at me, if they come at me with a big enough unit where I'll use it defensively to save enough of them. So that way on five wounds with base three defense and no resolve, or is it even if it does go crazy, your evade is at least two. You always have a two no matter what, because there's currently nothing that ignores that evade. So you'll have a two, which means two is re-rolling because bless should work on that. Um, but, but, but. Uh, sorry, defense rolls. Um, so yeah, but you still have your evade of two. Pause there, pause there briefly for a second, just to review. Yeah, since it's a defense roll, your defense and evade are both defense rolls. If it said characteristic, that's the distinction. So you're at least always on twos. You could be on twos re-rolling. So if you really need them to survive out, you now have a way to really help their defense quite a bit and make them much more defensive. If not, I try to save it because, hey, on five wounds... That, that's tough. Five wounds with no resolve is kind of tough to get through. And even if I still only have two of them left, getting that blessed, getting those wounds in is is a little bit more important in my mind. Um, this is a unit that I do take in threes, but I do like as a four pack if I can get it because one, the one extra means that now my impact could do a little bit more. I do get a good bit more swings because so they're five attacks each. Now I'm on 20 attacks instead. Now that flawless strikes is starting to become a little bit more reliable because now you're looking at after rerolls, three to four, maybe even to five of them. Now you're looking at removing potentially a stand because they're not getting their defense on that with their cleave of one. This is not a unit that wants to go into the absolute heaviest of targets unless you're big enough and you are wanting to change your flawless strikes which you can. Otherwise, I see them going into that defense two shield, defense three, defense three shield type units where I'm getting you to a 50-50 or that sort of piece. And then flawless strikes will help push me over that edge a little bit. Um, the hardened means that they themselves are a little more defensive. So you can go into people who are a little bit more hitty. So I find, uh, you know, glass cannons, going into not a bad idea what i like them for a little bit more is those grind units so units that don't necessarily hit the hardest but survive reasonably well and just want to win through attrition because they tend to do very well at the attrition one army does well attrition in general but when you look at some of these other units attrition only works when you have a good defense they have a good defense they can hit back hard, especially with those flawless strikes getting you a few in, because sometimes these attrition units just survive out by having pretty decent stats, having really good resolve. You can't quite get through them as fast, or you are in such a way where your defenses aren't good enough to survive long enough. Harder one on a defense three with no resolve means that you will survive for long enough. If you happen to have an Archimandrite nearby who can heal them up, if you are at least tier two, then you could heal up a stand if you're missing one. Or if you're a little bit higher, might be able to get that stand and a few extra wounds off of someone else who had been hurt. Um, I do like them in three packs. I like them more in a four pack if I can afford them. That's still sub 300 points because they don't need support. They're kind of on their own. Um, when we think about support options, um, obviously the banner that gives at tier two gives Inspire in eight inches. 
nice if they're close to it because then they're inspired. If they're inspired, they're hitting two thirds of the time. Now you're really starting to get the people. Although I will say, if you're aiming for those flawless strikes, you'd actually rather have more misses because you want more rerolls. Um, again, Hired Deacon doesn't really do anything for them. Archimendrite, this is one where the memories of old, useful um, for that dark power. Although, let's be honest, you're probably not getting it off on them because you need them to be in combat for that. And by the time they start getting into combat, you're probably tier two or very close to tier two. So not quite as useful. Um, giving them Aura of Death is nice. Remember, that's one of the abilities. It's which one? Dark Immolation. So you can give them an Aura of Death rule. So if someone is into you, so you got in last round, say they moved up, you got in, you did your hits. If you can get that on them early, then you're okay with it because you might be able to get a couple extra, a couple wounds on them to help decrease the numbers there. Fallen Divinity, again, that, um, uh, which item is it? I always forget which one's which. Where's R of Malice that gives Dread? Because on her, it's a range. That's especially useful here because with that R of Malice, with getting Dread, it's an 8-inch bubble, and this is a unit that's going to be up there with her. So that means your enemies aren't getting inspired. Much more important here. A lot of the other things don't really help. Uh, these units sort of stand on their own. For better or worse, they pretty much entirely stand on their own because there's not a whole, whole lot that I find that buffs them other than you get some real weird options. Um, so talking about just army builds a little bit. Again, I, I, we'll do some list building episodes if that's of interest to people. But overall, a little bit of army builds. Um, if we're not taking Fallen Divinity, and I, I want to take that out of the conversation for a moment. I'm going to do a whole separate episode just on the Fallen Divinity. If we're not taking a Fallen Divinity, you have a higher Deacon in there. Higher Deacon can get pretty cheap. Again, I take a few upgrades on the higher deacon to get a little more reliable spells because I want the dark supplication. I want to up my dark power pool. That's half the reason the higher deacon is there. The other half is to be able to take these. Um, for obviously can't be your warlord. So Archimander is not a bad warlord because you get the extra spell. You could take the mastery to uh, only mastery to get three spells. You could go um, Ziliarch. Ziliarch doesn't help them at all. I prefer on this Stratigos. A few reasons I prefer Stratigos. One, I just like the Stratigos and better, better in general anyway. I think the Warlord trait for the Stratigos is much better. So Stratigos Warlord trait is essentially that once per game you get the count. One, you can get the Tar Power Pearl 4. Cool. Once per game that you get to... Let me actually pull them up here in case anyone's watching. Glimmers of Golden Age. Um, sorry, Supremacy Ability, Warlord trait, same thing. Play a bunch of different games. Once per battle, you use it until the end of the round. All of your dark power pools, you count as one higher. So your empowerment level is one higher. And you get a free reform or combat reform. Now, that doesn't help the Keratid quite as much because they get that. Although I do like, sometimes I, I use his ability early to count as tier two when I'm naturally only tier one. At that point, at the point in the game where I'm going to get to tier two pretty soon, maybe you need to take out a standard two of mine and I'll get there. I like to use his ability then because then I'll be tier two. I'll at least get all my cool rules. And then if you happen to take out those stands, now I go to tier three. Now I'm always inspired. So my units that are in now get these extra bonuses or the ones that can do their draw events twice. What really helps is that can afford means that if someone got a bad charge on you, what I've done before is leave, turn around, and come back in. Now, you only get your impacts, but you can, or you can get out and get yourself into a better position. Or if you're fighting someone and they're pretty beaten down, finish them off, you can turn, and then now you have legal charge targets. So you do have some play there. Um, that's why I prefer... If I'm not taking the Fallen Divinity, Strategos is almost always my Warlord because of that utility. I've used that on the Cataphracty many times, a unit like this. It helps you not get out positioned, and it helps you get your memories when you need them. Um, the Keratids also want their memories whenever they can, or early, because turn two, turn or probably more turn three, let's say. Turn three, getting those extra shots means now you actually are affecting game state. Can't afford for what I want them to do. Um, I usually want them to come on like turn four 
I don't want them turned three because they have to come in from the back edge. 12's pretty far, but let's be realistic. You know, you're still looking at probably turn five to get them effective unless the enemy has rushed at you, which means if they come in turn four, they could come in behind someone who's a bit up the board, move 12. Now they could be realistically close to the middle of the board. Again, along an edge, but close to the middle, which means that now when they charge into someone, they have a lot better options. They should be able to position themselves in a spot to get you an early part of the game turn charge. If not, they might be able to be a counter charge for when an enemy comes in and then you can hit them on the flank. Um, for them, again, I don't take them quite as much personally because I've just been liking my book carefully. No particular reason why. Um, when I do take spots for canophores, I do see them a little bit different. I see them, like I said, I, I talked about where I see them fitting in terms of what they fight. I think Bukefili are aiming at the absolute heaviest things. I think these are aiming at just about everything else. I think with their nice speed, these are really good to be able to get towards that backfield because they can mix up with some of those other units. Like I said, my Bukefili, I'm worried about people who have super good defense or who are exceptionally killy because I need to take them down fast. Canifors aren't going to take them down as fast. Again, flawless strikes maybe, but otherwise you only cleave one. You're going to be more protracted battle, where Bukefili are not going to protract the battle. Same thing with Varangian Guard. Varangian Guard are not really going to protract battle. So I want to put either of those options into the people that I can't hang around with, who I need to take down. I'm looking at... Um, things like dinosaurs. I'm looking at things like some of the bigger Jotnars. I'm looking at, you know, any sort of cav option coming out of 100 kingdoms. That's who I want going into those. What I want Canifors for is everyone else. Whatever else, whatever else wants to stay on its objective, who wants to hold up, or who wants to just grind me down, that's what I want to put these into. Flawless strikes will get me enough damage through. Cleave one will lower your defenses enough that those units I can lose to get through. Hardened one means I have a good shot at being able to survive out. I said, especially if I can amend right, you can heal up a bit. So that's where I see this unit going. That's sort of their purpose in my mind. They're great as a four pack to get to an objective, to sit there and dare the opponent to come at you while you push your heavier hitters or just your board presence forward to go grab everywhere else. Um, if I'm running them that way, I'll actually run them as a little four pack. I'll sit them there like that rather than a row. I'll make them a four pack and I will golden age to get the free reform. So everyone then gets to do their full swings. That's usually the way I like to run them. So if I do that way, even if I, I run them as a three, I'll run them as a three one. So that way, or two one, I should say two in the front, one behind. So that way they're a little bit more defensive. So the opponent might get a few less swings on them, especially if they're running really wide, and then I can widen out as I need to. That also makes it easier to block out objectives because remember, the opponent, let's assume they're going to hit your front. They have to hit your front. If you have a shorter front, then you can worry a little bit less about how you're blocking off the objective. If you're wider front, the, if you have to usually get a little further to do it because the middle might now be open where this little bit smaller, you might be able to rotate in such a way where they can only get one or two bases on and you got that back base that is on that they're not touching. So that can help. Um, so if I had one box, what would I build? Um, one, I don't do one box. I got two boxes. And like I said, we have a discount code if you also want two boxes or more. Um, for me personally, I tend to run the carotids more. There are people who swear by the can of fours. They swear by the close combat. Don't get me wrong. I like it. But now that we have Bukefli, now that we have Varangian Guard, we have some options. I have some other choices there. And like I said, I, I, Hired Deacon can't be my Warlord. This will change when we talk about Fallen Divinity, but Hired Deacon can't be my Warlord. Archimandra, I usually don't want as my Warlord, which means I'm taking one of the other two, usually Shatigos. But if I'm taking one of the other two, I have the good combat options. I have ranking guard if I'm looking at Ziliark, or I have um, already options to put Kefali, or maybe even Bongolms with Archimandrite. I have some of those other choices. So the Canifors to me, I like them for that mid. So if I'm running out of points, I would prefer Keratids because what we don't have, especially right now, we don't have the shooting. 
And I do find anyone who has played against Bow Chosen, anyone who's played against um, was it whichever whichever clones, Vanguard clone, whichever ones are the ones that shoot. I always forget the names of all of them. But if anyone's played against something with a good range, decent shots, I'm going to tell you that is a board state changer. If they're off to the side, a 20-inch bubble means that that is a spot I might not want to be pushing into. Or if I do, I've got to push in and get to where I want quickly because otherwise I'm going to get carved up. So I personally prefer the characters, but characters I'll run as a three group. I think three groups are really good. I think more is very, very diminishing in return. However, can of force, I think as a three is good, four is better. And I don't think it's a diminishing return. I think you get a lot more out of four of them than you do of characters personally. All right, so that does it for this particular Conquest Corner. Um, so what we're going to do next, we are going to be talking Fallen Divinity. I think at this point I'll go to that because Fallen Divinity, now we've talked about the units she can take. And all the other ones when we get to them are all valid. But really, that's sort of the basis you're building the army around. And then you're adding stuff on the top. So I think that's a really good spot to do that. Um, I still owe a few um, why to play factions, 100 Kingdoms and all of that. They're the next one up as well. So I don't know which one you'll see first. So I'm off. This is uh, end of December. I'm off through about half of January, which means I'm going to be recording a lot more things. You might not get them all at once, but I'm going to record most of them. So I'm going to get the last few factions I need for why to play them. I'm going to get through this, and then I'm probably going to maybe swap into also some other factions, talking about their units as well. If you have units that you would like discussed or anything like that, put them below. Like I said, if you're on YouTube, leave a comment, anything like that. Tell me the things that you want to see. Um, like I, said, I, I do this based off of what I want to talk about, what people tell me they want me to talk about. So that's what I go through. Um, I, I also start again with the ones I know the best. Um, for other things we have coming out, we will hopefully get back to some battle reports with this. I really want to get back to that. It's just been tough for battle reports for various reasons. We all have all kinds of problems going on, but the hope is that things are better for a bit. If you like things from GW, like I said, we do a lot of 30K content. We're also going to do a lot of Imperialis content. We're hope well, I have a battle report I'm editing right now. You will also be seeing some more battle reports coming out soon because we should be recording those hopefully in the next few days. I'm going to record some videos about my armies for that and all those sorts of things. So we have plenty of content related to that. If there's anything else that you'd like to see, leave them in the comments. If um, you have been watching our content, first video you've watched or the 10th video you watch, anything like that, and you haven't subscribed yet, please do. It really does help us out. If you listen on podcatchers, hop on YouTube real fast, hit that button. Um, again, I, I hate that concept of e-bagging, but it really does help. And as we've already got more to where I want it to be at the end of the year than um, what I thought, which I'm very happy about, but going higher is always good. And we're still at about the 50% rate. 50% of the people who watch our videos repeatedly are subscribed. So that means half aren't. The more that you have, the easier it is to get found, the more it is that people find you, and the bigger the community around this grows. And that is a giant motivating factor. It is great to see um, the engagement and people talking about it and just talking about the game, especially for this. This is a game I want to see succeed. So the more people that are looking at things and finding interest in this game, the better. All right, that gives a little bit of what to expect, what's coming out soon, and a list of things that forces me to record them. So on behalf of everyone here then at the show, has a good hobby, it's a great gaming.